The most vulnerable feeling in the world is stepping into joy. Because what if it gets taken away? It is harder to live in a state of celebration than it is in sadness. You are listening to the Redefining Wealth podcast with Patrice Washington. In today's episode, we sit down with the host of the Don't Keep Your Day Job podcast, my girl, Kathy Heller. She says that clarity will only come in the doing. Hey there, this is Patrice Washington from patricewashington.com, where we chase purpose, not money. Welcome back to another episode of Redefining Wealth. A shout out to all my OG listeners and new purpose chasers. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This couldn't have been a better episode for you to stumble upon because it underscores so much of what I believe uh, when I say live your life's purpose. And I was introduced to Kathy Heller just a couple months ago. I actually started following her, I think, months before that. But she found me a couple months ago. Nevertheless, we got on the phone. We hit it off. And I am so excited about this episode. Uh, I was actually going to release it a couple weeks ago in conjunction with our Creative for Purpose uh, challenge. But, you know... I always think that God's timing is divine, so it's here now, and I know it's going to serve a great purpose now. There are so many nuggets in here about purpose, and if you are stumbling upon this thinking, well, I thought this was a money podcast, here's what you need to know. Our community believes that wealth is so much more than money and material possessions. We believe that wealth is truly about the condition of well-being. And I talk about purpose so much so that you heard me call the audience purpose chasers because I believe that when we understand our purpose, we can set our priorities powerfully. And one of the challenges that people have with sticking to their financial goals is that they're so unfulfilled that they use money many times poorly in a way to fill the void uh, of what's going on with not being in purpose. So I love every time I get a chance to talk about purpose with someone who gets it and Kathy is off the chain. So Kathy Heller is a fire hose of inspiration. She's the host of the popular podcast, Don't Keep Your Day Job, which has over 12 million downloads. I think it's even more than this now. It has been featured in Forbes, Entrepreneur Magazine, HuffPost, Inc. Magazine, Business Insider, you name it, she's been there. Each week, she encourages thousands of listeners to find more purpose and get paid to do what they love. She's a phenomenal coach, and she's helping people everywhere add their gifts to the world. Without further ado, here's my girl, Kathy Heller. Welcome to the Redefining Wealth Podcast, Kathy. Oh my God. I'm such a fan of yours. You are such a gorgeous human and I love it. Thanks for having me. Okay. Well, you I already told you we're like chocolate and vanilla versions of the, same, <laughs> <laughs> of the same person. Not only have we lived in similar neighborhoods and just all this stuff. I, my mind is blown right now by how generous you are. You are. Um, I feel the same way about you. I just, okay, let me just jump in. So here's one of the things that I really want to start with is what was your inspiration for, I don't want to say for don't keep your day job yet. I want to say, really, you tell a story about your mom and how it inspired this whole movement of who Kathy is today. Can you just take us back a little bit and tell tell us about that? Yes, uh, you really did your homework. Yeah, you know, I think that if you look at any person who's really on a mission and driven, it's coming from something deep. You know, like I watch Tony Robbins and he'll like stand on stage during his events for like 12, 14 hours at a time. And you're like, dude, we've already gotten our money's worth and he's unrelenting. And I think it comes from there is a deep, deep place where he felt like he needed to do this work. And I think that that's true just for anyone. I think Oprah, like anyone Mm -hmm. who you see. And for me, it was the same. You know, I grew up watching my mom sort of withering away with her mental health, very, very depressed, suffering my whole life from 
just feeling like she did not want to be here. And she did, um, she, she did go through a few phases of being suicidal. And um, I just saw a person who, whose gifts were dying inside of them. And it was really like a cautionary tale. Like growing up in my house, my parents had a really bad marriage and it, there was abuse in my house. And then my dad left and my mom went from bad to worse. And I used to think to myself, like, how can this be that you grow up with all these dreams only to become an adult that's miserable to be told that like, of course, marriage is awful, or of course you have to give all of your dreams away. And maybe if you're lucky and you get to retirement, then you can do something fun. It just didn't make any sense to me. And I was carrying around all of this pain because I grew up feeling it from her. And so I was determined to create a different kind of reality. But I also felt so invisible as a child because my parents were both so consumed in their own stuff. And so I I always had such empathy for other people who felt invisible. And I felt like one of my greatest gifts was being able to shine a light on other people and say, wait a minute, don't you see yourself? Don't hold up a mirror and say, don't you see this quality or this, this talent that you have or this way that you are in the world? This is so amazing. Don't give up on it. Do something with it. And I was always that kind of person. It really has led me to where I am now, what I do for a living. I just love how vulnerable you are in sharing that story because a lot of people, you know, in my group, for example, Command the Stage, I had one young woman who wanted to tell the story, but it involved talking about things that weren't that great about her mom. And she kept saying, well, I don't want to put my mom in this light. I don't want to do this. But at the same time, it was holding her back from really embracing the fullness of this story, which has led her to where she is today. And it's clear to the audience that there's a disconnect, right? When you're not completely transparent or just vulnerable with that story. How did you become okay with sharing this way? You know, it is an important question because I do think that we... I mean, in everything that we do, we worry so much what people will think. We worry so much that we might put something out in the world and we might not be liked or someone might reject it. But especially if it's like our parents, you know, we we might keep ourselves small and not shine our truth because we don't want to offend someone. But what I always say is that, you know, the truth shall set you free. And mm-hmm. and the bottom line is that I wouldn't have the the meaning in my life if it wasn't for all of this. And so I also thank my parents because you can only have you can only help someone home if you know their address. You can only help mm. someone out of a well if you've been down there before. And so I really feel grateful that that there was some Um, there were, there were some challenges in my life because it gave me my purpose. I think often our pain turns into purpose. I think if you look at the people who have changed the course of history, Dr. King, I mean, we mentioned Oprah before, like these are people who, who understand pain and there's a sensitivity and there's a, a wanting deeply to solve a very important problem only because they've, they've lived that problem. Mm -hmm. And, and those are the people that make incredible light shine in this world. So I don't know. I mean, I feel like my parents get that. And I think the truth of the matter is that it's not so scary to share because I think every person has a story. Yes. Everyone who's listening by the age of 10 or 11, raise your hand if by the age of 10 or 11, you had your heart broken. You know, raise your hand if someone you you love very much... Um, hurt you or hurt someone else you loved or walked out and never came back or passed away. Raise your hand if you dreamed a dream and you were vulnerable and it wasn't received or you were you were um, sort of embarrassed or somebody ridiculed you or criticized you. I think what we all do is, you know, we're so, we're survivors. You know, we all have uh-huh. been given the task to soldier on. And when you think about yourself, at eight years old, standing in the living room, and you think about what she's gone through since then and even before then, I mean, it's incredible that we've all survived. But the way we survive is by creating these like survival skills, which protect us. And some of it is like not acknowledging our story. Some of it is not sharing. Some of it is not dreaming too far. Some of it means not putting ourselves out there or loving anyone again so deeply. We have all these beautiful ways that we, we've, we've had to sort of adapt in order to not get hurt. But now those ways that we can have compassion for those things, a lot of times those are the things that are suffocating us. But my point is that 
every person is carrying around this inner child Mm -hmm. that has been through it. And so maybe by sharing our stories, we realize everyone has a story. So what, what is there to feel shame around? And even our parents, right? Like, oh my God, I don't want to offend my parents. It's like, why should they also feel shame, right? Every parent did the best that they could with the tools that they had. And instead of shaming yourself for being the kind of parent who didn't have the tools to deal with your mental health or whatever it is, how about just inviting all parts of yourself to have tea with you every morning? Like, can you imagine Mm. if when you had tea in the morning, you invited the part of yourself that's fierce, the part of yourself that's self-sabotage, the part of yourself that's a liar, the part of yourself that's a coward, the part of yourself that's a just so courageous and such a badass and like, welcome it. Like you are welcome. Like, let's do this thing. Like there is just so much shame, like all over the Instagram, you see everybody wanting so badly to curate this version of themselves and and trying so hard to get you to believe that they are only this other thing. And that's not true. There is no person who is one dimensional. Uh, Kathy, you, have, you said like 19 things that I want to unpack. Oh okay, the first thing I have to say is, man, I just completely agree with you. The meaning in the mess, like we all carry mess. But the thing is, you get to define what that means for you, right? No one defines that but you. And I choose to see all of this messy stuff that has happened in my life, the things that will come in as either a lesson or a blessing. Yeah, And so because I see it as a lesson or a blessing, people ask me all the time, how do you get on the podcast and share all your business? <laughs> right? yeah. And I'm like, because it was either a lesson or a blessing. I'm not going to allow myself or anyone else to shame me because of my story. My story is my story. And these are the experiences that I needed to go to go through, excuse me, to become the woman that I am today. So one of the things I teach the ladies in command the stage is like, listen, You tell your story so that way no one else can weaponize it. People Mm -hmm. can't use it against you. I remember before I went on Fox News and told the world Mm. that I had filed bankruptcy, someone was threatening to tell people. And I was like, I mean, I just haven't told people. I'm not scared, right? And I was like, you know, because I was already known as a finance expert. And they're like, how are you a finance expert if you file bankruptcy? I'm like, the reason that I have the compassion that I have for people is because of my story. It's because of what I went through during the recession. It's because of having to scrape to rebuild my life and not wanting people to have to feel like they, they got to do that alone. So I'm not, that is also no. And that's also the story of every successful human being. Elon Musk was borrowing rent money in 2008 from friends in order to be successful. You have to swing for the fences. You you have to try things and you're going to have to, you know, get out of your comfort zone. And it, it successful people, it's not that they never fail. It's like they fail fast. They fail often. They learn from failure and you keep going. So, I mean, that's not a shock to me. And the other half of the coin is why the shame? I come back to this. Why the shame? Like, have you ever realized your vulnerability is your superpower? Mm-hmm. Like you should be the first one to be like, yeah, my kids are on screen time. I drink a glass of rosé every day. I, <laughs> why should you be like, no, no, no. I only eat organic. I meditate 16 hours a week. Like, I mean, I don't, that's exhausting, you know? And what makes you beautiful is the fact that you are broken. You know, in Japan, they have this incredible practice where when they find an object that's broken and they go to put it back together, they will emboss the broken parts. Where it goes back together, they'll emboss it with gold so that Mm -hmm. any person who comes along and picks up this vase will know where it was broken. And then they actually say that it's worth more. It's more valuable because it's broken. We, if we could only just lean into our brokenness, we would realize that that's what makes people cleave to us because who do you want to be around? The person who's like, I'm perfect. My marriage is perfect. My life is perfect. I have avocado toast every day and I'm crushing it. Or do you want to be around the person who's like, I am all of these things, the good, the bad, the broken, it's all welcome. Cause what that does is it gives you permission to be welcome. Now you're welcome too. And the thing that's really interesting, especially now, because we're living through COVID and people are saying, oh my God, oh my God, this is the worst, this is the worst. 
What people don't realize is last year in 2019, 1.4 million Americans attempted suicide. And 54% of our country was taking some form of antidepressant because people, the reason people cited for it is loneliness. So why, why the loneliness? Because no one's actually being present. No one's really being true. Everyone has so much shame around their brokenness so that when you think you're talking to someone on social media, you're talking to each other's avatars that you've built. So then you feel shame. Oh my God, if this person only knew. And this is of course why I'm such a failure. And this is of course why my marriage and more and more people are are just feeling worse and worse about themselves because there's not a real authentic this is me and this is you and let's just let's just hold space for each other yeah. which is so gorgeous you know let's just accept and and what i've found um in the research especially doing my own podcast is that the episodes that go viral it's not how big the celebrity is of the person who's on the show cuz we've had people on like Mandy Moore, Bobby Brown, Jenna Fisher from the office, Howard Schultz it's not it's how relatable the content is. So, so if I say something like, you know, how to overcome imposter syndrome or how to live on your own terms or how to stop, you know, how to, how to overcome the fear of failure. Those are the things that people listen to because what we're all scrolling for, you really ask yourself, like, what am I scrolling for all day long? You're scrolling because you're hoping, you're hoping, hoping, hoping that something will make you feel less alone. That something will make you feel like someone gets it. Like somebody fricking gets this moment you're having right now. And it is the most healing thing to say, you know, no, my husband and I don't have sex every night. You know, no, I sometimes yell at my kids. No, whatever you say, it's like, allow people the space, right? To just feel seen and just watch what people will bring. Just so much goodness and light. So much goodness. I remember when I would not go live on Facebook until I had makeup on. Mm -hmm. This is a few years ago, Um, probably like three years ago now. I just would not go live unless I felt all done up. Yep. And I had come home from the gym and I was super sweaty and nasty girl. And I was walking through my house in South Pasadena, headed towards um, the bathroom. And I was like, oh, that's a great. I had like one of those, you know, inspired moments, like a divine download. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I got to get that out after my shower. And I felt like that presence that what I call like a still small voice that was like, is your makeup more important than the message? Mm -hmm. People need this message. Do you think we have time to wait on you to get all dolled up? From that moment on, I started to just show up with whatever, however I look, however, whatever it is, this is what you're going to get. If it's a bonnet today, it's a bonnet, (laughs) but you are going to get it because the message (laughs) is more important. And that's what I try to stress to my audience, to my community, is that people are not consumed with your perfection. You not having to be all perfect reminds people that it's okay for them not to be perfect because none of us are anyway. And the truth is when I see someone who's really successful in their business, what I see is radical empathy because people don't buy things, they buy feelings. Mm -hmm. And so it actually is a hindrance. Like the more perfectly you do your makeup, it's going to be harder for you to drop in. So just be careful with it because what people really, really want is they want to be able to feel like I can't put my finger on it. But when this girl goes live, Mm -hmm. something's going on here. There's an exchange here. This is real. And they're craving it so hard, right? So business is radical empathy. And it's not just empathy for your consumers, for the people watching your content, for the people buying your programs, for the people buying your products. It's also empathy for yourself. That's where it begins. And when you give yourself permission to have a top knot on your head, and you have no makeup on, and you just share from the heart, words from the heart speak to the heart. And it is heard and it lands versus trying so hard and nothing's coming through because right. we are putting so many filters on this thing that no one can hear anymore. And no one, because it's about feeling, it's a felt sense response. That's what makes people lean in. And I'll tell you along those lines, everybody would tell you all day long, I'd rather have a million followers than. 4,000 followers. It's not true, actually, even Uh in the actual data, because it's about the engagement. It's about the real factor. So it's better to have a curated, engaged group of 4,000 followers who get you, who know you, who accept you, they feel accepted by you, than to be this like, you know, media star 
where you have four, you know, 400,000 people following you and there's not a lot of deep engagement, Mm -hmm. that's, there's a difference between followers and clients. There's a difference between tribe and just like, you know, a bunch of people sort of like scrolling by, you know, you want these people to, to feel seen by you and interact with you. And, and when we do that, we can build just the most incredible tribes and communities. And I think people, people overestimate, you know, what's necessary to become successful. Like I need to be Beyonce. I need, I need to look like this, sound like this. I need to have this many followers. It's like you underestimate what you can do with three or four real conversations a day. Yes. Like that's where it's at. Oh, this is why I love you, Kathy. Oh I just my God, adore you're you. You're so adorable. Like, girl, when I left the Steve Harvey show, I was there for four years doing a weekly segment. And mm-hmm. in April 2018, I left. You know, I told them goodbye. It was my four year anniversary. And I remember yeah. telling like friends and telling folks that I was leaving, they were like, what? what are you doing? Those are millions of listeners and all this stuff. But I felt so clearly in my spirit. I was like, listen, listen, listen. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Those are people who stumbled upon me. They were coming to be entertained by Steve Harvey as they should, right? And they stumbled upon a young woman that was giving this personal finance advice and by then talking about redefining wealth, but that's not really what they were looking for. The difference between them and my podcast audience are many of the reviews, many of the DMs, many of the emails we receive. People start by saying, I was praying for something. I had just prayed. I had just journaled. I had just meditated on this idea that I needed someone to guide me um, through this process, or I wanted to be better with money, or I wanted mm-hmm. this and that. And then I, I came across you. You just appeared in my Instagram. You just appeared. Someone shared your podcast with me. Someone yeah. shared this. There's a different connection when people have oh, been thousand searching. Thousand. Yep. They've been searching for you versus stumbling upon you. And I think that's where we get it confused. We look at these large Instagram accounts or Facebook pages yeah. or whatever, and yep. where we assume that everyone who's there was searching. Some of those people stumbled upon it. They clicked like, and they never thought about you again. But the people who were searching, the commenters, the engaged folks, the ones who follow up, who DM, who, Mm -hmm. you know, follow through with whatever you ask. Yep. Those are your people. And that's where you should spend your time. I want to give you a quick snapshot because I think it might give your listeners a real like sense of, oh, Mm -hmm. that's so electrifying, all that possibility. So I... Came out to LA, struggling, whatever. I had a record deal. I actually got dropped from Interscope, got a day job, was like, what the heck? I, I'm, I got something to say. I got dreams. I was so close. I don't want to be at a day job. I hate wearing pantsuits. And I, I left the day job and then tried to find a way back into doing music. Long story short, I wrote music for film and TV for 10 years. I wrote songs for Pretty Little Liars and Switch to Birth and The Fosters and Grey's Anatomy. And I did that for a decade and I made wow. like decent money maybe like $200,000 a year, 200, 300 writing music for Coca-Cola ads. And it was just really fun. But I became a mom and my husband and I wanted to buy a house in LA. And the only house that we could afford was like this small little house, like not in the best part of town. And I'd have some good months and some hard months being a songwriter. It wasn't something I could like, you know, count on. And then we didn't know what we were going to do. And so what wound up happening is a a friend of mine said, I wish you could teach me how you built a music licensing music to television. Like, and I'm like, I don't know how to teach that. And I wound up just kind of like organically saying, you know what, I'll have a workshop. There's been so many songwriters who've asked me this over the years. I'll just have people over to my house. Like that's how things start, you know, one little step at a time. So I had 10 songwriters come over and after three hours, their mouths were like agape. They're like, Oh my God, that's amazing. That's what you've done. You met the head of Disney soundtracks. You met this person who works at this ad agency. You flew out to Minnesota and you met with Target. Oh my God, you got songs on all these things. I've never made $3 writing music, let alone that much money. And you've done it over and over again. And then I got a call from this woman who was a friend of one of those songwriters. And she lived about three hours north of here in San Luis Obispo. And she said, since I don't live near you, would you do an online version of that class? And I was like, I don't know what she's talking about, right? Like I didn't know (laughs) online anything. And this is only 2016. So this is only three and a half years ago. And I was like, what is she talking about? I was pregnant with my third daughter. And I started to think, what if, what if I could create something that would be like really thriving and sustainable online so that I could buy 
the house I want for my kids. So that we, maybe, I mean, it could happen, but I didn't have the list, you guys. I didn't have an email list. I didn't have an Instagram. I didn't have a podcast. I had nothing at the time. But I was like, you know what? I'm pregnant. I got a due date, which is September 7th. This baby's coming. Let's just do it. Let's just be scrappy. And so I decided like, look, we were just talking about you and me, Patrice. I decided I'm not going to be curated. I'm not going to have the perfect look. Here I am. It's the summer in LA and I'm pregnant for God's sakes. You know, and I don't know the first (laughs) thing about slideshows, but I'm like, let me just try it. So I go online without an Instagram yet. I had a Facebook, I had a personal Facebook page and I like make this little thing on Facebook that says, if you're a songwriter, I'm going to do my first free class online for free, right? Knowing that at the end of that free class, I would offer a paid class, but I didn't know what I was doing. I was just going to do it to do it and just, you know, sort of learn my way through it. So friends of friends of friends, songwriters, whatever. And I said it was going to be six weeks away. Okay. So I had six weeks to talk about it, talk about it. I then go live. I think I used uh, Google Hangouts. I I don't even remember. I I didn't know what I was doing. Had my big pregnant belly, not a single slide. Like I didn't know even how to make a slideshow. And I just talked and like gave my heart And it was really authentic because here I was this pregnant woman with a lot to say. And it was just so obvious that it was me, you know? And so I share. And at the end, I said, if you want to take my class, it'll be, you know, a hundred bucks a month or 997, but it's a 12 month class. And, uh, and I'd love to share with you over the next 12 months, you know, more about this. 147 bought my pro 47 people bought my program. Girl, shut I, up. I made $147,000, Patrice. Listen to this. Then I start the program. Then I have my baby and I'm like, oh my God, I can do this in my pajamas. I don't have to go to the studio, write a song. I don't have to fly to Minnesota. I don't have to fly to San Francisco. I was like crazy before that, you know, just trying to get yeah. one deal, trying to get one song and one ad. And then I'd have to do it again and reinvent the wheel again, write a new song, you know, hopefully make another $50,000 for Pepsi. But it was like, I'd have to constantly find it. Like I'd have to constantly find the work. Here I was making $147,000. It was amazing. Then I launched the class again, six months later. Now I launched a little bit better. Like I had a little bit of a list, right? Because I had a few songwriters, still didn't have an Instagram, still didn't have a um, podcast, but launched it again. That second launch, we made 441,000. Then I started my podcast but my podcast wasn't even for songwriters. My podcast is called Don't Keep Your Day Job. And it's all about how the heck do you do something creative that you like and make a living with it? Because that's what I did with music. And then that's what I also was able to do with the class. The podcast took off, but my podcast doesn't cover music. I still didn't launch anything to the podcast. I launched again, the music class. Launched it again, made 700,000. Launched it again. And I kept changing the program and the program kept getting better until it went from 12 months per thousand to three months for 3,000 because we had testimonials that like it, it, I got more confident. The people sold Uh it for me. People told other people, people wanted to get in. It was just so easy. You know, once you have a student who gets a $54,000 Starbucks ad and he had never made any money, you're done. Once you have a student (laughs) who gets a song in a pay less commercial because you gave them you know, all the, whatever, you know what I'm saying? It yeah. just kind of does it on its own at some point, if, 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 it's, if it's a great class. But the point is, I then went on to launch 15 other programs since that started. I've taught a podcasting course. I've taught a business accelerator. I've taught a side hustle program. I mean, just so many different programs. And now when I go to launch, it's one to, it's like one to $2 million a launch. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying to you, as sure as I'm sitting here, I didn't have perfect slides. I don't, I still don't know what a funnel really does. I've never been able to do that and master it. All I know is like, it's like you said to me when you and I were just talking before we hit record, it's very spirit led. It's very much from the heart. I really feel built to serve. I really believe that every person was put here to do something. I believe God doesn't make extras. So I feel like if I can go, come on, wake up, let's go. Like, I feel so like called to help people find more sense of purpose, especially because like you started with, my mom was so depressed and I don't want to see people sitting in their homes, binge watching Netflix going, why do I feel so down? I don't want 54% of our country to be suicidal. I want people to feel like I wake up every day and I do this thing that makes me feel like myself. So 
I love what I'm doing. And I, it's like really full circle. Cause now with my podcast, you know, every, all I do is help people become an entrepreneur and, and do this for themselves, however they want, whether they're making pottery or they're organizing homes or making cupcakes, it's just such possibility out there in the world. And now that I've interviewed over 300 people from Candace Nelson, from Sprinkles Cupcakes and Sugar Rush to Barbara Corcoran, like you can just see everything that my, my, my guests have in common is that they started from zero and then built something from nothing. And my point is, and I hope I'm being really clear, the, the cost of admission is not perfection. The cost of admission is not a list of 100,000 people. The cost of admission is courage. And the cost of admission is, I'm going to be so real that people are going to be so refreshed. And it's incredible what I was able to create, not from thousands of people who knew my name, not from marketing budgets that were you know, well beyond what I can conceive of, just a small gathering of humans who were there for it. And, and oh my God, like I now make multi seven figures, multi seven figures. And I'm just a mom with three kids and I'm not famous. You know what I mean? Like, please, like, let's understand the opportunity, especially during COVID. Like, you yeah. are living in a moment where maybe just maybe you don't run back to what you had. Maybe you create something that's really what the world needs more of and maybe what you need more of. And you build your own business and you wake up every day and online, you have the ability to connect with just a small group. And from there, you change your life and you change their life. Mm. Well, that's the show for today, guys. Uh, where can we send <laughs> Kathy's collection plate? <laughs> so good. Oh, I just love it. I love it. I was talking on Instagram about sloppy progress. Mm-hmm. We would just give ourselves permission to make sloppy progress. Like just get freaking started. I don't think that we understand how much purpose is revealed in the doing versus the thinking about it forever. Oh my God. Well, the clarity only comes from the doing, right? Mm-hmm. Like the thing is that there's never been a human being that I've met who has an idea and then launches it and then it's perfect. And then they do that for 20 years because it's all about testing. It's about thinking like a scientist and going in the lab and going, let me put this out in the world. It's like quick iterating. It's like test, 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 rapid fire action. And then Everybody else is sitting there overthinking the first step. You've already taken 12 steps. It's now 16 days later. And now you're cooking because you figured out who your audience is. You figured out what they wanted, what they didn't want. And you only learn that by taking lots of action. So the only thing that's in the way is your ego. It's, oh my God, what if I fail? Oh my God, what if I get rejected? So I'll just overthink this first step when no, the only way to build a business is to test and ask questions and then get the feedback and listen and pivot and lean in and keep tweaking and it's all beta. So if you're not willing to just keep trying and testing and taking action, you're never going to get to what you're actually meant to build because Mm -hmm. you're always building the engine while you're flying the plane. Yeah. And the people that you say you feel called to serve will continue to suffer, you know, because if you don't stand up and doing, do it, who's to say that somebody else will. And even if they're out there, it doesn't matter. Like it's not done until it's done by you. Can I, I don't say care. something about this. Yes. Like, before I lived in LA, I went to Jerusalem on like a two week trip and I wound up staying for two and a half years. And I realized that every single person was put here for a reason. And the one, and one way that you know that is because everyone has a different fingerprint. Like everyone has different DNA and people love diamonds and gold, but the most rare thing is a human, is an individual. There never was your DNA. There never will be, right? So God doesn't make extras. So the way that I look at it is like, I have three little girls and once in a while, my six-year-old and I are doing a puzzle. And this happens quite frequently where we will be finishing the puzzle and we are missing one piece. And it's so frustrating, right? It's like, oh, (laughs) the piece of the tiger's ear is missing. It just doesn't feel complete. And it's an annoying feeling. That's you not showing up. You are needed to complete the puzzle. We need you. So this whole idea of like, who am I to do this thing? I'm not Rachel Hollis. I'm not Patrice. I'm not Steve Harvey. I'm not fill in the blank. It's irrelevant. That's false humility. That's not about, it's not about you. You're needed. God put you here because you're needed. So it's not about, oh my gosh, well, I'm not so-and-so. 
No, it's about you doing it because it's you and no one else can do you or have Mm -hmm. your exact perspective. Think about siblings. Like I have a sister and she's awesome, but we are so different. We have the same parents, grew up with the same problems, very different, right? She's a different, you know, astrological shine. She has a different way of like, she's just a different spirit. Like we're just different. Our perspectives are different. So no one's going to tell your story the way you tell it. And here's the thing. Even if someone told the exact same story with a very similar perspective, there's over 7 billion people in the world. (laughs) Come on. Like we need every person to say I'm available. And it's not about being the Messiah. It's not about being perfect. It's about raising your hand and saying, I'm just available to try to help. Can I just add something to the conversation that's going to make maybe this person's life or day a little tiny bit better. Like, and, and I think that we have to change our relationship to failure. Cause I don't think the failure is it got rejected or I put out the podcast and I didn't get enough downloads. The failure is not it's, trying. <laughs> exactly. It's like your job is making the choice to do the thing. Mm-hmm. Let God take care of the rest. Like whatever's supposed to come from it, your failing is exactly what you said. You just didn't make the choice to do it because everyone knows you've been given a bag of tools and you know what's in your bag. And often when you're about to use those tools, that's when you're going to hit resistance uh-huh. because you're breaking through that upper limit of like, this is what I can do. This is what, who am I to do this? And it's because like we said, you know, a few minutes ago, there's a child who lives inside of you whose heart was crushed at some point and you don't notice it, but you've, you've built defense mechanisms to which you don't let yourself try for what you really want because the, the most vulnerable feeling in the world is stepping into joy because mm-hmm. what if it gets taken away? It is harder to live in a state of celebration than it is in sadness. Mm. That's good. I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that. You know, I've only recently felt it. Like so much of my life was like the struggle, the struggle, the struggle. And then it's like, you do the work, you know, you go through 13 rounds of fertility treatment, which I did. And you have the kids and you go through marriage counseling and your marriage is finally good. And you build this business. And then you go, why am I so uncomfortable? It's like, oh, cause I'm terrified that maybe I have shame around. Do I deserve it? God, this feels uncomfortable. Who am I to have this? And then you go, wait, what if I just let myself enjoy it? You know, and you go back into that living room and you, you go meet yourself as an eight-year-old and you go, you don't have to live here anymore. Yeah. You can stop working so hard. You can just open up your arms and let the love in, let the blessing in. And it's hard to do that because the last time you did that, the people you were supposed to trust, mm-hmm. they broke that trust or they let you down. And so you protected your heart, but that's not doing you any favors anymore. Mm. There's something we say often here, Monique Coleman um, from High School Musical back in the day was on the podcast and she Mm -hmm. said, your business is only going to grow to the extent you're willing to heal. Oh my God. I'm obsessed with that. I have to write that down. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And while people have all of the education and they've taken all of the courses and the programs and they've listened to all the podcasts and read all the books, there's that thing that still keeps them from actually being able to implement or having the courage to do it again if it didn't quite go the way you want it to the first time. Mm -hmm. And I think some of it is related to what you're saying, even for the people who have had like, you know, um, some level of win, It's that, but do I belong here? Like I'm so used to struggle mode. Um, As my friend Brandy Harvey says, you know, some people feel programmed for less. (laughs) They feel programmed for less. And therefore when there's more, they create ways to self-sabotage so that they're back to their comfort zone. Yeah, that's it. And one thing I learned, I was reading a book by Donald Miller and Mm -hmm. yeah, he's so good. And he was... He's in this one chapter, he was talking about falling in love with his wife and that journey for him and what was coming up for him, what he was healing through. And he said, you know, I was always trying to be impressive. Like we'd go to dinner and I would try to like, you know, share, you know, something that would make her think I was smart or funny, you know? And he said, and I realized like she wasn't, she wasn't responding to that stuff. 
And I was wondering why. And he said, and at one point she said, you know, you don't have to do that. You could just be with me here, you know? Mm. And he said, and I remember reading this paragraph and I just like stopped in my tracks and like the tears came. He said, I realized in that moment that if it's love, you can't earn it. Love can only be given. Mm. And I got that like a rocket just landed in my heart. I was like, oh my God, my entire life, my relationship to being loved was I had to earn it. I had to save my mom. I had to save my parents' marriage. I had to break up their fights. I had to beg my dad to come back. I had to litigate on behalf of my mother in court so she could get help. I had to, as a child, hold up the world in order for them to even see me at all, let alone like, you know, sit with me for five minutes. You know, there was no like, here's a grilled cheese sandwich. Just be your, just be a kid. Why don't you tell me how you're doing today? Like I had to prove myself, earn it, be cute, sing in the living room, get some kind of, you know, and I realized, God, my whole life, I've been walking on my knees for thousands of miles in the desert and I'm exhausted. And so I think most of us, it's not love. It's something else because if it's love, it's only given. I mean, think about your life, right? As hard as it is, think about what a gift it is to be alive, right? Mm -hmm. And you think, what could I have possibly done to prove to God that he should give me life? Mm. But he just gave it to you, right? He just gave it to you. You didn't have to earn it. You know, or you have a child, like we have three beautiful girls and we went through so much fertility drama. And I think when I held them each in my arms each time, what could I have done to earn that baby? What, what could I possibly have done for this gift? There's no equivalent. He just gave it to me. And that's when you weep because you realize I'm going to let myself receive unconditional love and then hopefully give it to this baby too. Right. So we just, we have, we have broken receivers because we don't really understand that we are swimming in love. We are swimming in possibility. And if we could just stop working so hard to be perfect, to prove ourselves, it's coming in in the biggest way. So good, Kathy. Uh, I know I have to let you go. So I'm going to end with some redefining wealth, rapid wisdom questions. I love it. I'm here for it. <sighs> okay. Just tell us the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. How fun. How do you define success? <sighs> first thing that came to mind was balance, balancing, getting to like spend time with your kids in the backyard, playing ball with the work that you find meaningful, getting to do both. Mm -hmm. How do you define wealth in three words or less? How do I define wealth? Um, plenty, energy, possibility. Mm, I like that. Plenty, plenty, energy, possibility. Okay. Um, what's one book that has redefined how you see wealth? Oh, how I see wealth. Um, Jen Sincero, You Are a Badass. <gasps> That's one of my favorites too. Yeah. <laughs> so <good. laughs> okay. Last one. Fill in the blank. My name is, and to me, the truth about wealth is. My name is Kathy Heller. And the truth about wealth is that what people pay you for is not the product or the service. It's where you resonate energetically. And when you give yourself permission and put that crown on your head and they feel that you know your worth, they will just write a check because they actually are paying you for that energy equivalency. And they want to be sidled up next to that wealthy feeling of energy, whether it's a Chanel bag or it's that you charge more for your therapy sessions. Like they want what you feel energetically you deserve. And that's what they actually get they actually get from that transaction mm. when you stand in that resonance. Mm. Come on. Uh, Kathy, thank you so much. You've been such a blessing today. Uh, I know your audience you're... is going to just eat you up. And please, you guys go check out Kathy's podcast. Don't keep your day job. When I tell you it is just this times 10, you 
I know of falling in love with her right here, right oh, now, yes. but go get some more of it because she is the bomb. Kathy, you're amazing. You're my you're- new friend. Uh, You're my new friend for sure. And you are so easy to love. You've done such a graceful job at becoming your queen self while not having any sort of affect to you. And really you're, you're not like, look at me. You're like, come with me. Let's do Mm. this. And everyone feels it. And you should be blessed to keep doing and to keep having opportunities to shine your light. All right. Didn't I tell you? Oh, I I, I never lie to you. I tell you every week these conversations are going to be so good because they are so many nuggets in this episode. The one that I want you to remember, if you remember nothing else, is that you can't overestimate what it takes to be successful. I love that Kathy said the cost of admission is courage. It's not a million followers. It's not perfectionism. It's courage. And Everything that I do with my program, Purpose to Platform, or what we talk about in our Facebook community, I just want you to have the courage to live your life's purpose, to know that you have the right to be happy and to be fulfilled. And that is truly what wealth is all about. Having more money and being miserable, what does it really mean? (laughs) That's not the life that I personally want to live. I have no desire to be a public success and a private failure. I want to be well. I want to be well. I want to be well in every area of my life. If you have not done your six pillars of wealth assessment, I encourage you to go to patricewashington.com forward slash start here so you can really start to dig in to these six pillars of wealth. The work pillar is all about living your life's purpose and... Shout out to Kathy. I just love this episode so much. Also, Kathy has a book, Don't Keep Your Day Job. It was released in November 2019. It's filled with inspirational stories from people in her community who've taken control of their life's journey. Really some great nuggets there as well. So check out Don't Keep Your Day Job, the book and the podcast. You can find me in social media at Seek Wisdom PCW. Of course, I'll be in the Redefining Wealth community on Facebook talking about this episode. So come over, chat with us, tell us your aha moments, what stood out to you. You can also find me on Instagram, Seek Wisdom PCW. Go look for Kathy too. Find Kathy on Instagram and tell her you found her on the Redefining Wealth podcast. She's at Kathy with a C dot Heller. C-A-T-H-Y dot H-E-L-L-E-R. Find her on Instagram and tell her that you heard her here on the Redefining Wealth podcast, all right? That's it for this week. I want you to go live your life's purpose now. (laughs) Find fulfillment and earn more without ever chasing money. Talk to you later.